Hello, and welcome to the ELECTS webinar on Library of Congress bid frame developments. This session serves as an introduction to the five-part webinar series from Mark to bid frame. Additional information about the series, including registration for the next five sessions, can be found on the ELECTS website. The direct link will also be shared at the end of today's webinar. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's webinar will have four presenters from the Library of Congress. Sally McCallum is Chief of Network Development and the Mark Standards Office. Judith Cannon is Chief of the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division. Kirk Hess is a Digital Project Coordinator. And we also have Paul Frank, Specialist for the Cooperative Cataloging Program. They each bring much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have them with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will I'm sorry, um, this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access the slides and recording on the ELECT website. And now, here is Paul. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Thanks, Erin. I hope you all can see my screen now. Um, I wanted to thank not only Erin, but um, Mary, Megan, Catherine, and Julie at Alex for allowing me, Paul Frank, and my three colleagues here in the room, whom I'll introduce in just a second, to talk about the developments in BibFrame at the Library of Congress. I'm, I'm really excited to share what we're doing here at the Library of Congress with you all, but I'm very grateful to Alex for allowing us this opportunity to present in this this um, impressive series of uh, webinars that's coming up over the next um, month and a half or so on Wednesday. So, so it's it's exciting to be at the beginning of all of this. Um, I'm the last listed on the uh, presenters list, as you'll see on the next slide. But I am actually the first one that, that you're going to hear from, and I'll sort of do the coordination here. Um, I have the um, timer in hand, and I have the shepherd's crook to pull people off when, when their time is up. And I have to say, um, I didn't plan on saying this, but, but I recently got my first smartphone. So there's nothing more insufferable than dealing with someone who has a new smartphone, but I've learned that it has a timer. So I'm going to be setting the timer for each of us so that we keep within keep within our, our set time limits. So um, here you see the, the presenters, and this is the order in which, um, well, no, actually, I take that back. Sally McCallum will, will speak first, and then we'll have um, various speakers throughout. But we really are, are trying to uh, strive for um, an informal type of presentation where where each of us will take the lead in an area, but we we all make comment as well based on on what the topic is. So we'll start out with Sally McCallum talking about BibFrame 2.0 implementation, and um, we're starting with this for a specific reason because when I looked at the the series that's just beginning of webinars uh, on on the future mark to bib frame. So much of it was forward looking. And although we've done a lot of work here at the Library of Congress already, I thought it would be appropriate to start out our presentation with a look forward and where we're heading in the future with, with bib frame. So Sally will be first, and then she'll turn over the, um, the phone to um, my colleague, Kirk Hess, who will talk about the, the bib frame profiles that that we use not only in the first phase of our bid frame pilot, but that we are modifying for use in phase two of the pilot. Then um, Kirk will pass the, the phone over to Judith Cannon, who will talk about the work that we're doing ongoing with, with our bid frame pilot phase one participants. And then it finally comes to me where I'll talk about some special format areas that we're working with, um, with our pilot participants. Then all of us will sort of have a, um, 
involvement in the discussion of LD4P. And um, you'll hear exciting, um, exciting developments within the entire library community as we move towards BibFrame. And then we'll come back to a sort of grassroots uh, look at the PCC, Program for Cooperative Cataloging, BibFrame task group that just was formed this year and is doing some exciting work. Judith will talk about that. And then we'll close with a look at RDA's influence on BibFrame 2.0. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the future and we'll come back to the present. So um, I hope you find it enjoyable. Um, as Aaron said, you know, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. So please, please hold them if you can. And I'm ready now to pass the, um, the phone over to Sally McCallum to talk about BibFrame 2.0. Good afternoon or good morning, whichever for whichever time zone you're in. I'm Sally McCallum, and I want to first just briefly say why we're doing all this, why we're engaging in a marked bib frame uh, uh, pilot and uh, work. Uh, Mark is a senior citizen, as we all know. It's respected. It's useful but it's ready for a younger data exchange theories to take over and, and, and fulfill its mission on into the future. So we, and that, by that I mean not just LC, but the whole community uh, is experimenting with current technologies. Uh, link data and its supporting of, of resource description framework. Um, today, which are today's prominent ideas for uh, moving forward and, and, and into the future and having more visibility on the web and for providing richer patron experiences. So we're hoping for that. Um, this is an active time for investigations and uh, this excellent uh, elect series provides an overview of several different projects I think as, as you'll see in the next in the coming weeks. Uh, but in particular, we're going to talk about BibFrame and the pilots that we're putting that we're putting up here at the Library of Congress. So after several years of talking, converting, revising, talking, converting, revising, doing things sort of offline, uh, LC's director of cataloging, Beecher Wiggins, made the I think bold decision to support an actual pilot with uh, a group of LC catalogers, real catalogers who he would take off of doing their normal work and let them uh, ex experiment with doing this experimental work. Um, they learned about BibFrame, they learned about RDF, Resource Description Framework, they uh, learned a new editor technology, all sorts of things, and there were about 40 of them that he had doing this. Mind you, 40 is, I must say, because many of you may be in a library that you don't even have 40 catalogers, but we have almost 300, so that's uh, a small group of our catalogers. And then they input descriptions using the BibFrame. BibFrame editor. And, but to uh, simulate the environment, we needed a pilot system. And that was the challenge, a system we couldn't use our old OPACs or anything that was uh, already out there. We had to build something at, at ourselves. We learned a lot from that pilot. That was last year, last winter. And we're gearing up now for our next pilot this next winter. And I'm going to move the slide. OK. Um, <clears throat> so step one for the new pilot is to, uh, was to have revisions to the model and the vocabulary that we're using in the BibFrame uh, project. Uh, there you see on the screen the uh, uh, model as it looks now. And it has some differences from uh, what, it, what it did for the first pilot. Uh, it's still, however, innovative and simple. It still has works which are uh, corresponding to Ferber RDA works and expressions. It has instances which correspond to our manifestations. But now it has items also, which we had treated those as annotations, something that sort of hung off of a work uh, in the first uh, iteration of BibFrame and decided that, that there was too much going on with items that we needed to have them as separates. 
Another thing I might point out that's slightly that's different. I mean, you can see that a work you have it it has subjects uh, associated with it, it has agents associated with it, but it also has events associated with it. And our experience with our audiovisual catalogers, uh, they really needed to have events be something that was more than just a subject. It could also be the content of the work. And so we we essentially raised the level. Uh, of events in the in the new model, so the two big big differences. Uh, well, uh, let me just say, with in the model, you see instance, which is not different from what it was. Instances have publishers hanging off of them. Uh, the format of the work, uh, you know, is it a book? Is it an e-book? E whatever. And items, uh, you have barcodes, you have uh, who holds it, and so on as attributes of items. So, um, the, the, our next step after the model revision was to get the vocabulary, to, to revise the vocabulary. And here we had lots of input, a lot from uh, the community. We had, uh, first of all, our own pilot participants in the first, in the first pilot. And they had, uh, they had given us a lot of feedback and they, we had allowed them to add elements to the vocabulary when they felt they needed them, because that gave us then at the end of the pilot a, a list of, of elements that would be, that obviously were useful to catalogers. We had a PCC test uh, uh, um, task group that uh, uh, gave us recommendations, and we incorporated those. We had a listserv with uh, over a thousand comments that came in, and we incorporated the, uh, many things from those. We took those and uh, organized them and decided what, what we could use and what we, what we uh, could not use from the list. We had a, we had a GitHub place where, the, uh, where people, anyone in the U.S. could, um, or anyone anywhere for that matter, uh, could um, convert records, convert their MARC records automatically and look at it on the screen. And as a result of that, we had over 200 comments that came in from people who have tried, to, tried conversions and they didn't like this, they didn't like that, they were looking for this, they were looking for that. And so we, we took all that into account. But also, we also had some uh, experts, experts with the resource description framework uh, that, that could uh, advise us on um, what they thought ought to be the uh, uh, so, some of the attributes of RDF that we should take advantage of better in the in the new vocabulary. Uh, it, it also, while we're aware that the that, that rules change, as you can see when you get the updates to RDA, it's changing every I don't know quarter, every six months, every year uh, at, already. But also, some people don't use RDA. They use different cataloging rules. And it, like Mark, we have always tried to, um, Mark was heavily oriented to AACR, but it, was, it tried to be hospitable to other cataloging rules. And we we're trying to keep that in mind, even though we felt that one thing that was missing in the 1.0 vocabulary was RDA. Uh, the influence of RDA. So we do have a heavier influence of RDA in this new vocabulary. Um, then we started writing specifications for conversion of MARC to BibFrame. And there we were assisted by the fact that there are a surprising number of patterns in MARC so that you can, you can say you convert this this way and then you can say and you convert all these other things in the same way. Uh, that really, really helps, and I wish we, um, having been with Mark for many years, I wish we had more patterns, but uh, that's, that's the past, and we have what we have. We do have duplication, we have different forms of expression, and we have an abundance of data. Those were the problem areas. Um, we had, you have uh, data or information that is given in code form and in text form and in controlled text form and in transcription form sometimes. And you, when you're going forward into trying to transform that into BibFrame, you've got to make some choices. Uh, you've got to bring these things together. Uh, th this is, uh, is not uh, easy to do. Um, 
an obvious example is the place of publication. We have it in coded form, and we use it extensively in coded form in the 008 if you're a Mark, if you're a person who's <laughs> conversant with Mark, and we also have it as as part of the imprint. Um, we have also many fields that are structured, and those that are, and then we have the same data in an unstructured form, and particularly when we have it in the unstructured form. Uh, we have to make decisions as to whether this data applies to the uh, work level or the uh, instance level of, of a resource. And really, it's only the cataloger who originally made the data that can tell you whether it was really applied to the work or applied to, to the uh, uh, instance. There are not really any hard and fast rules that say that a piece of data is always one or the other. Um, we also had to make some decisions on um, how, what we left behind. And there are some things that in MARC <clears throat> that crept in over the years because there was not an alternative to MARC for, for, for exchanging the data. For instance, patent data. Uh, we don't, there, there's very little patent data uh, in the MARC formats, but probably the patent office or some specialist in, in, in patent uh, technology would have a better vocabulary for that. And that's the kind of thing we ought to be thinking about leaving behind uh, in our MARC data and in fact, and instead in our MARC vocabulary, rather, pardon me, in our bib frame vocabulary and instead uh, 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 pointing out to uh, another vocabulary that has, that understands that data better than we do. Uh, another p area is preservation data and we have we now have premise. Uh, we have other vocabularies for preservation data. We had we had wedged it all into Mark. Maybe it's time to uh, uh, unwedge it or, or uh, look to other vocabularies for it. Um, okay. So then, once we had the specs done, and they and let me say the vocabulary was done in April of this year, and the specs have just recently been completed. Uh, we now are working on writing, having the conversion programs written. And there, we're not doing it that ourselves. Uh, we have uh, uh, have a contract with Index Data, a company that makes software uh, for open source software for libraries. Uh, and we are paying them to, in fact, a, as a consultant, to um, make the conversion programs for us. And uh, from Mark to Bibframe. Uh, and then after we finish those, which we expect in a, another couple of months or so, uh, we will be merging and reconciling the data. Well, I say after. We Actually, at the same time, we're going to be working on the merging and reconciling. Because that is an enormous task, actually. Uh, you've got to take the uh, your authorities, your name title authorities, and, and transform them into bib frame work descriptions. You've got to take your bibliographic record and split them up uh, so that uh, if there is not already a work uh, description, there becomes, you make one, and uh, you also have an instance description. And even within that, you, the instances have to, some, some of them may be split up because they um, uh, have, uh, in our MARC bibliographic records, we quite often put the uh, book form of the item and the electronic form of the item on one bibliographic record. But in our new environment, we would have a, an instance for the uh, e-book and an instance for the print book. And so we've got to be able, we've got to figure out how to tease those apart and split those apart in the instance uh, area. Um, we're also dealing with a lot of ambiguity, as I mentioned before. Um, and I, I know this because I've been looking at the specs very recently that uh, uh, attributes of some attributes could apply to a work or to an instance or to an item depending on the um, uh, what it is about and what what uh, how extensive it is whether it's only about that one item or whether in fact it's about a whole lot of the items that are of of the uh, so therefore, it's about the instance. So we we have we have to deal with that in writing our conversion, and we have to make a decision. We can't say it's both. Uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the um, so another task which we're doing in parallel is revamping the bed frame editor, the editor that the uh, catalogers used when they were um, uh, doing the first pilot. Uh, we had a lot of lessons from the first pilot about the editor. Uh, we have a lot of lessons that, that point to updating the profiles, and we have to, uh, and we're thinking of making editors for names and subjects this time. The first uh, time, first pilot, we only had an editor that allowed them to input bib frame uh, bibliographic records, that is, bib frame works, bib frame instances. And, uh, now we're thinking of having an editor also for them to input bib frame names and subjects uh, in, into an editor, into this new environment. Uh, Kirk Hess will talk a little bit more about about the uh, uh, updating the editor and updating the profiles because he was the one that uh, really worked on that in the first pilot, along with Paul Frank, who also who actually uh, designed all the profiles and um, worked then with Kirk to uh, get them coded for, for the participants. And he, uh, Kirk, um, Paul also maintained a constant dialogue with the cataloging, catalogers, participants in the pilot so that we could adjust these things as the, as the pilot went on. And uh, I think that was that was useful to them, and it was it was important to us to see what they were liking and what they were not liking. Now, another task is to expand our uh, linked data service, LC Linked Data Service. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with that or use that, but there we have all of our name authorities, our subject authorities, and many of our uh, code lists uh, in that system, and. Uh, other systems can download, as linked data, other systems can download this information. It will be in, in uh, RDF and uh, it will be able to be consumed by a linked data uh, uh, system that is able to uh, use linked data. Uh, we need more term lists for the editor and uh, we're adding a lot of classification schedules and, and uh, we have uh, a lot of expansion to do with that and, and sort of revision because that is an old system in some ways in today's <laughs> the way that time goes these days in technology and it's been up for five or six years now and it has about a million uh, hits a day so it's it's much used and it has to be treated with great care. Uh, we also have a very special task of restructuring our infrastructure. Uh, th this is um, uh, could be highly disruptive, but we're we're planning to we're trying to keep it to a minimum. We're going we are getting all new virtual servers for our platform, and we're updating our platform from one edition uh, version to a, a much later version. And we have to do all of that, even though the pilot will be put then on this new platform. ID the link data service already operates on this platform and it must be able to be moved without interruption because as I say thousand a, a million hits a day people don't want an interruption and uh, finally we have the documentation and training now that's that looks like one short little line but someone's going to talk about that a little bit more later because it was a very large task as you can imagine taking 40 catalogers and teaching them RDA bib frame and a new editor and they took to it and they liked it and they did an excellent job and enthusiastic job in the first pilot that that was an enormous task and it was very well done so we come to my final slide and uh, we are uh, Essentially, the takeaway for you, I, to, in my estimation, is that we see these pilots as essential for and understanding where we're going to go in the future with MARC, uh, with my grading MARC to a new platform, and with uh, getting libraries as part of the linked data environment. And uh, the corollary to linked data environment is 
a better user experience for our users. And our key website is the one that is there on the slide. And now I'm going to turn the uh, webinar over to Kirk, I believe, uh, who uh, will be talking about uh, editors and um, profiles. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Next slide. Okay. Hi, I'm Kirk Hess. Uh, I'm a, a digital projects coordinator at the Library of Congress, and uh, two projects I've been working on within BibFrame are the pilot um, profiles and the editor. And I'm going to talk about the profiles today. Um, basically we were evaluating um, how to enter information, uh, we were looking at, we have different types of resource types, essentially. So if we, this example is for a monograph, and the monograph would have basically particular uh, properties that you wanted to enter. That might be different than if you had a different type, like uh, you know, 35 millimeter film or an audio CD. Uh, <coughs> so we had the, this particular piece of software uh, developed and then we used it in our pilot. Um, initially when we were uh, looking at the uh, old profiles, I think in a, we only had very very limited information and it was very specific to BibFrame. So uh, one of the efforts we did here is that because in our cataloging for monographs here at the Library of Congress, we use the RDA descriptions. We try to include those as part of the, the mapping so that when you're uh, you're entering the, the creator of the work and it has the RDA uh, term there for you. Um, so we're able to do that within the profile editor to put that description there. There's a link out to the RDA toolkit if you have questions, but it actually gets coded as in BibFrame. <clears throat> Another thing that we as, as Sally mentioned, we have a lot of lists that we need to look things up. Um, so in this particular example, uh, we're trying to look up names. They're, they're left anchored so that you can type them in. And down at the bottom of the screen, you can kind of see there's a thing that says values, URI. So that goes out to our link data service and actually does the searching. So what we're trying to say is that for this particular person, um, if you want to do a lookup, you look up in ID. We could switch that to any other uh, service that that works the same way ours does. We we had to code the editor a little bit to to use our API uh, method, but it would work with other ones. In this case, we're just using ID. Um, so I kind of zoomed in here. So this basically goes out there. If you went out there on your computer, you get a little a screen and go into ID, you could actually search for it from there if you wanted to look for different names. Um, so basically it's processing the same information. Instead of in an HTML interface, um, it's doing it basically through JSON that gets populated in the editor and that way we can pick names. And the names themselves are I URIs, so link data. Uh, so we know who they are. It's not a text string. It's actually the, the uh, ID that's been identified. So if you do go to our link data service, id.loc.gov, we have many different lookups. Names are definitely the most popular. Um, we also have, of course, subject headings. Um, and then a, a variety of different lists, including many RDA lists. We actually imported many of the RDA lists into ID just so that we had um, control over those lists themselves and make sure that they were up and available. Um, we ran into some problems where we were relying on an external service like R and it went RDA and it wasn't working quite right. So that's one of the kind of challenges with the production system is you want to make sure everything works and you at least have some control over it. So, and there's a little bit of tension with that with, with linked data because linked data is supposed to be linked. So in some ways we should be able to link and trust everyone, but sometimes you may not trust another organization necessarily, or you may just have some other like technical issues that you want to control. Um, but this is definitely something you, anyone can try out as well. Look in there, see if there's anything you're interested in. Okay. Now I think at this point, we're on the next slide, 
and so we're going to talk a little bit more about our uh, phase one, which is officially ended, but it's going to keep going, and Judith Cannon is going to take over from here. So here's, here she is. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Judith Cannon, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the phase one pilot. But one of the things that I want to say to you that you won't read in the report is that I think a lot of the reason the pilot was such a success was the cooperation between the Network Development and Mark Standards um, Office and the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division. I think without their support and um, the way they engaged with the participants, it wouldn't have been nearly such a success. I also want to add here that until um, I began working with them, I had no idea of how difficult it was to create something called BibFrame and what it really meant for us to be able to engage in the linked data environment. It is far more complex than it appears on the surface. When you're looking from the outside in, uh, you don't have any real or true appreciation of what is facing people that are trying to move us into this new environment. When we began um, phase one, of course, we had to put training materials together and we had to decide what to teach people and how much to give data to give them on, or I should say information, on linked data. And here we were guided by um, the programmers and staff in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office. We put all our training materials up on the Catalogus Workshop page, that's loc.gov cat slash cat workshop. But if you put in um, the Catalogus Workshop learning page, I'm sure it will come right up if you were to Google it. Um, we created the training in a modular format, and I think that it worked very well. And uh, we will be doing the same when we create the training um, for phase two. Although the pilot's officially ended, the um, participants are supposed to be working one day a week in BibFrame. And what they were instructed to do was pick a day of the week and to create records just using the BibFrame editor not to worry about putting them into the LCILS Voyager and to, on another day, to put them into Voyager so that this one day a week they would focus entirely on creating records in the BibFrame editor. Uh, part of um, our instructions were that we would write a report on how the BibFrame pilot phase one went and we've provided you a link to that report. I think if you want to learn a lot more about this, uh, you should go to that report and read it because it's very comprehensive. That report was submitted um, and made public just before ALA um, annual conference. When we were actually in the pilot, um, the phase one, which is where they are still working right now. They have not moved to phase two. No one will move to phase two until the Network Development and Mark Standards Office says that it's ready. And so that's probably going to be early in 2017. So right now, even though they're continuing to work, they're using um, the materials and the editor that was created for phase one. These um, participants are still giving us feedback and telling us what they want and what's not working or what's working very well. Over the summer, we didn't meet with them on a regular basis, but we've resumed meeting with them now, and we plan to meet with them monthly until we move into phase two, when we'll be meeting with them a lot more regularly. Um, we're counting on these participants to help us design training for the next group of participants. 
because we're expecting in phase two this pool of pilot participants to be augmented. Now one of the important things that we had to deal with um, when we were in phase one pilot was that we had to make people realize that they were pioneers, that they were moving into something that, that was new and unknown. Um, and that they had to not worry about the features that were not available to them, the mistakes that they couldn't correct, uh, and that no one would judge their cataloging on what was in the um, pilot. And uh, I think that helped to reassure them. And I think as we go into phase two, we're going to have to provide that reassurance too, because this is an evolving thing and everything that they want or dream of having is not going to be there initially. But I will say this much, all of those that participated enjoyed it. They were excited. They're ready um, for the next pilot and actually they're quite eager for it. Now I'm going to turn the, um, this over to Paul Frank because Paul is the one that worked most closely with the people on audio, visual and photographic resources. So I'd like you, him to share his experiences with you. Thanks, Judith. Um, you heard already Sally talk about the pilot phase one and Judith talked about pilot phase one. But I want to give a broad overview. So, so the reason we wanted to test BibFrame was to see how it works, of course, see if it's a viable way to um, convey bibliographic data. But when we started the pilot, we wanted to be sure that all of the participants in the pilot could do their normal work as they are doing it in MARC. So for most of the participants, that meant using RDA as the cataloging code. But at the Library of Congress, we have other sections, other divisions that are not using RDA. For example, the audio-visual participants who participated in the pilot use um, AMM, Archival Moving Image Materials, a cataloging manual. The, the sound recording participants still use AACR2 for, a lot of, for, for almost all of their work. So we had a real challenge here, and I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about that, because I don't want you to go away thinking that this was only about RDA and BibFrame. This, this was testing BibFrame for other cataloging codes as well. Now, for the purposes of our pilot, we wanted the audiovisual participants to use RDA for cataloging their resources. So we had an additional um, jump there with having them become familiar with RDA itself and then take their RDA descriptions and uh, input them into the BibFrame editor. For me, speaking personally, this was perhaps one of the most satisfying outcomes of the pilot because I got to work very closely with the with the catalogers who who work in MM and they they know it very thoroughly. And it also brought into play a topic that I'll mention in a in a little bit in a future slide about the um, modeling study that was done for audiovisual resources and bib frames. So we had a real um, gold mine of experimentation to do with, with audiovisual uh, resources in BibFrame. And in fact, we, even though the pilot officially ended sort of a soft ending on March 31st, as Judith said, we've continued the work with the audiovisual participants throughout, throughout the summer. And one thing we added towards the end of the of March 31st end of the pilot was uh, cataloging 35 millimeter audiovisual resources as well. So we were not only doing Blu-ray DVD that you'll see if you look at the um, the profiles that that are available for you to access externally, but we also did 35 millimeter cataloging um, film cataloging, and, and and that was quite exciting. Now for sound recordings, as I said, they they um, continue to use AACR2, but but I have something very exciting to to tell you about, and it sort of was an unexpected 
bonus because they um, were totally new to RDA. We wanted them to try doing some work in RDA, and I discovered that um, their knowledge of RDA was fresh, and they were not encumbered too much by the dependency on MARC that we did notice in some of our seasoned RDA participants. One of our, one of our lessons learned was that catalogers often are very dependent upon MARC in describing their resources and a little bit less comfortable with going to the cataloging code to find answers for things. And I don't think that's a situation that's unique to the Library of Congress. I think all of you probably can relate to that quite well. I mean, it's a very easy dependency. You know MARC inside out and you know what MARC does but we have to look at how our cataloging codes relate to the MARC standard. And then when you put something new, when you're introducing BibFrame, you cannot rely on that dependency on MARC any longer. You really have to understand your cataloging code completely. So I enjoyed especially the work that I did with, with these special format catalogers, but we also have a third group of, of catalogers who joined the pilot um, Towards, towards the end, and these are our prints and photographs catalogers who use DCRMG, Descriptive Cataloging of Rare Materials for Graphics, not RDA, and we learned quite a bit. I mean, this was a two-way exchange, too. Um, the prints and photographs catalogers taught us a lot, taught, taught me, speaking as, a, as an RDA cataloger, taught me quite a bit, and um, and on the other side, we, we shared a lot of information about how BibFrame works. Now, um, the, the second sub-bullet here I added, and it, it's an arguable point, but, but in creating the profiles for DCRMG catalogers to use in BibFrame, I found that the mappings were actually easier than the RDA mappings. Now, anyone who uses RDA knows that it's a very deep code, that it has lots of detail. DCRMG maybe does include important details, but across the board, I think there are fewer details, so it made it a little bit easier to, cr to create the mappings. But uh, one thing that we learned, or I learned, was that um, certain types of information unique to the cataloging or graphic materials needs to be addressed. And the one that I'd like to bring up as an example was the concept of state, which is, if you work with graphic resources, it's a more, more or less a production stage of a print um, that, that changes over time. It's, it's not really an addition. Some people refer to it as an addition, but it's not quite the same as an addition. So here's something that might be an interesting addition in a BibFrame extension, the concept of state. And, and things like this are being looked at as works, as our BibFrame work and our linked data work with uh, graphic materials moves forward, not only in our Library of Congress BibFrame pilot, but also through work in the um, LD4P project that this particular project being coordinated by Columbia University where they are looking at graphic materials and um, how BibFrame deals with those. So, so it's interesting that our BibFrame pilot work here at the Library of Congress sort of branched out and now um, uh, a sort of a meeting of the minds with the LD4P group working with the Library of Congress photograph catalogers as well. So this is, this is really a segue to our next topic which is talking about the linked data project yeah, um, hold on, I'm going to add, Judith would like to make a comment. Um, there's something that I didn't say, but I think it is important. When we began the pilot, um, due to circumstances that were beyond anybody's control, we um, had the staff participating in the pilot enter their records, first of all, in um, the ILS Voyager using Mark, and then turn around and enter them in BibFrame. And they started doing this work in October 
2015, and it became very clear to us by December 2015 that this really wasn't working. Um, they really weren't learning the editor. They were thinking Mark the whole time. They were translating from Mark into BibFrame. So we turned it around and we had them starting to work in BibFrame and then to put their records into the ILS. Because what I should say to you is that the BibFrame records that are out there that you may be able to see right now are all going to be discarded. It is not the master file. The master file remains um, our OPAC catalog that you can search now. And so we have to have the records not only created in the editor, but we also have to have them created for the ILS Voyager. But if any of you are going out there um, to practice and your institutions needed you to create the records in two places, I would urge you to um, create the BibFrame record first and because it enables you to sync the BibFrame editor, whereas the reverse, you, you tend to be more glued to Mark. So that's just something that I if just I wanted to say it just in case you don't read the report. This comes out in the report that we provided a link to, but should you not read it, I think this is an important piece of information. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to someone else now. Hi, thanks, Judith. This is this is Paul again. Um, the Library of Congress began BibFrame development in 2012, so four years ago. Uh, maybe a little bit more than four years ago. There's been a lot of experimentation since then. I think you can see that our BibFrame pilot phase one was an example of experimentation with BibFrame. But not only at the Library of Congress, but outside in the, the entire information community, I think there's been a lot of experimentation with BibFrame. But um, perhaps that, that's a great thing. Everyone doing their own experimentation is positive. But Perhaps now is a time, and LD4P, linked data for production, is the what LD4P stands for, is the time to create a more common environment of standards and protocols that allow libraries to interact as they have in the past with other bibliographic initiatives. So um, maybe this is the right time, and I, I believe it is for us to come together um, more, more cooperatively. So um, that's, I think, the basic reason that linked data for production came into being. It's a Mellon-funded grant, grant to transition technical services production workflows to linked data workflows. Um, there are funded partners, uh, Columbia, Cornell, Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford. The Library of Congress is participating, but not as a funded partner. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the Library of Congress is doing, and my colleagues will, will um, add their thoughts as well about the LC initiatives in LD4P. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the projects in general. I think all of you know or can understand that um, we have local workflows. I think they're, they're based on necessity, they're based on um, certain needs that at the local level, and um, we, have, we have dealt with them. And so what may work locally for you might not work for another person. But the value in these workflows is important, and I think the linked data initiatives can assist with making workflows more more universal. So I know that identical workflows can't be developed for all institutions, but the standards for the output of the workflows can be universal. And so that's the reason, um, or one of the reasons, that these funded partners are working with their with locally with resources and um, hoping to share, and, and the, the, the community at large is benefiting from the experimentation and the, uh, the documentation of, these, of this local workflow work that's being done at the institutions themselves. But um, at, at the Library of Congress, 
Um, the task is, is a, a little bit different in, in our involvement with LD4P because we want to look particularly at the conversion of our local workflows to linked data and see if the conversion of a workflow, the entire span of a workflow from acquisitions to discovery, is that possible in the linked data environment? So, so our focus, and um, certainly we learned quite a bit from the first phase of the pilot, and we continue to uh, anticipate learning more as we move into phase two, we're looking at that entire scope um, sort of a local workflow on on steroids, you know, the entire process from acquisitions to um, getting something out for public public discovery. So the back at, at, to uh, um, LD4P as a, as an as a, uh, a organic group, um, the first phase began in March of this year, 2016, and the the um, the charge or the um, expected results from this first phase are to produce metadata, metadata as linked data communally, explore extensions of bib frame ontology to encompass the many formats that library process. And I, ma I made an, uh, a reference to that when I talked about state, when we're working with the prints and photograph resources catalogers, how do they deal with that concept of state that's unique to their resources. Um, also, part of the first phase is to engage the broader library community to ensure a sustainable and extensible environment. And um, now more specifically, looking at the LC projects, we have four non-funded non non projects that we are um, uh, contributing to LD4P. One is with our audiovisual and sound recordings collections, and I, and I mentioned the unique aspect of those a few minutes ago, um, using the uh, AV modeling study as a guide that was commissioned and uh, looked at bibframe issues with audiovisual materials, looking at sound recordings collections, not only current uh, sound recordings, but archival sound recordings as well. Prints and photographs work will continue, looking at DCRMG, you know, what about those ontologies that are unique to certain, certain uh, formats? How do we deal with those in bibframe? Sally did a great job, I think, of talking about BibFrame 2.0. That's one of the projects that we're working on with LD4P. How will the BibFrame 2.0 vocabulary look? How will it change over time? What will, how will it be um, updated? Things like that. And then finally, BibFrame and RDA, which we really did learn a lot about in our in our pilot, because primarily. Our catalogers were working with um, RDA as their, their cataloging standard. So I guess you could say that our continued work with the pilot participants that Judith described in um, the meetings and the, um, the finessing of the, of the editors that we used in the pilot are, are an ongoing project. Now, w one thing that I will say that um, the continued work that we're doing with RDA and our pilot participants is still in the BibFrame 1.0 vocabulary. So we are looking forward to testing BibFrame 2.0 when we get into the next phase of the pilot. But as Sally mentioned, BibFrame 2.0 was heavily influenced by the but by the results of our experimentation with 1.0 in in RDA. So that's a, um, a very broad overview of the LD4P projects with a little bit of a focus on what we're doing at the Library of Congress. But I want now to ask Judith to talk a little bit about the uh, PCC BibFrame task group that has relatively, uh, that's a relatively new project. And I'm gonna check with my colleagues to see if they wanna add anything to what I said about LD4P. We're good? Okay, so here's Judith uh, Cannon and uh, some talk about the PCC BibFrame task group. Hello, it's me again. Um, if you were listening very, very intently, and I hope you were, um, you would have heard Sally say that um, she got some data from PTC that helped her with a vocabulary. And I'm about to talk about the PTC BibFrame task group and tell you that it started in um, August of 2016. And you're probably going to think, heavens, how did Sally get all this information from them um, so quickly and get it um, incorporated? Well, the actual fact is, I'm going to talk about 
the PCC bib frame task group, but before it actually began in August 2016, there was a CONSA task group that was working on bib frame and looking at it. And it was this group that submitted its findings to the Network Development and Mark Standards Office. And they looked very closely at their findings and incorporated whatever they could into the bid frame 2.0 vocabulary. Going back now to talk about this um, PCC bid frame task group, the PCC has decided to support in um, bid frame. It has not said that it will adopt bid frame, it's just said that it will support it and look at it very closely, which is what they're doing. And um, the PCC um, bib frame task group was actually set up in August and it has two subcomponents. One is a CONSA one and one is a BIBCO one. And they're looking at the standard records for both CONSA and BIB, BIBCO and they're mapping them to bib frame. And at the same time, they're exploring the bib frame 2 vocabulary and they're going to report their work up to the bid frame task group that will report it out further. The bid frame um, task group is very interested in linked data and um, many of the people that are serving on the PCC bid frame task group are also on other um, groups that are looking at bid frame or um, linked data, uh, URIs, and um, some of them are even on LD4P um, committees. So there's a lot of interaction between all these groups, which I think is extremely healthy and is helping um, to advance the profession towards its goal of participating in a linked data environment. This group, the bid frame task group, will um, submit reports twice a year to the um, PCC policy committee. And of course their findings will be passed on to the Network Development and Mark Standards Office for um, consideration and for um, developing bid frame further. So, now we're coming towards the end of our program and one of the things that I do want to remind you before I let each one of the participants um, say some words about RDA's influence on BibFrame 2.0 and that is that as has been stated earlier, BibFrame isn't just for RDA. It's to embrace a variety of tools that are used by people to describe resources and to make them accessible to the patrons. And this is all about making our data more accessible to patrons. And embracing the linked data environment will allow us to do this. It's going to take probably several pilots more before we're at a point where people really feel they can take this and run with it. But I'm very confident that um, within the next couple of years we'll see a remarkable breakthrough and um, people will be getting ready to adopt this in a much wider for a much wider audience. I'm going to let Paul add something more now. I wanted to say something about the, the comment that BibFrame 2.0 by comparison is much more RDA friendly. And there are two moving targets here. BibFrame is constantly changing. We're learning as we move along, we're changing, we're improving. But RDA is not static. RDA is changing as well. 
So you have two moving targets, maybe target's not the right word, but two moving objects, and trying to link them together is a huge challenge. So when we did our pilot phase one, we were using BibFrame 1.0 vocabulary. When I was working with Kirk Hess, developing the profiles, we realized that there were certain elements in RDA that were not mappable to BibFrame. So we, as I said earlier, we did not want our catalogers to have to do anything differently in their work in the pilot. They, if they were cataloging an RDA, they had to use RDA instructions. So in many cases in the pilot, we would mark certain entities with in a way that said, hey, consider this as an inclusion in BibFrame 2.0. And Sally said, so much of BibFrame 2.0 was influenced by those entities that, or those attributes, entities, however you want to call them in the Ferber RDA model, that we identified that were not present in 1.0 and needed to be um, present in 2.0 to assist catalogers working with RDA as a cataloging code. But to look at where RDA is changing, I'm sure all of you are aware of the reference model, the Ferber Library reference model. Um, how will that affect BibFrame? It could have a big impact on BibFrame. Um, the RSC is, is planning their meeting in Germany next month, and a lot of the preparation for that meeting involves reviewing materials that are generated by the LRM, Ferber LRM. Um, one thing that we observed and uh, have talked about publicly is the reconciliation of the Ferber vocabulary with BibFrame vocabulary. How do you map them when you're dealing with four major attributes in, in RDA? And I'm talking about the work expression, the Ferber group one for a work expression manifestation and item. How do you map those to a BibFrame vocabulary where work really would cover an RDA expression? Um, is that concept going to be under consideration or discussion within the RDA community itself, the, the uh, work expression dichotomy or, or reconciling those or, or, or maybe refining those. So the, the point I wanted to make with this slide, and I know I talked quite a bit about it for just a little slide, but, but that we really are working with things that are constantly in flux, not just bib frame. So, so much of our work will need to be reactionary in the sense of waiting to see what happens with one thing before we can react with um, how it would work in bib frame. And that's not only RDA, but I think it's really any, any standard that's used in describing resources in our community. So that, um, Sally wanted to add one more thing. Yeah. Might be a good, good appropriate ending. Back to the beginning. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Paul has, has emphasized, and I think we all have talked a lot about uh, things changing in flux and, and things of that sort. But to be able to do these pilots, in fact, we have to have stability. And we had the vocabulary itself has got to be stable because we do a convers conversion to mark. We convert 19 million records. And we can't do it the next week and the next week and the next week. We only do it once for the pilot. And then we have the, the editor and, and all of the pieces, the moving parts of the pilot system, and they need to have stability. So we, ha need to ha we have to have these sort of pools or periods of stability that are all based on the vocabulary uh, for each pilot. And then we evaluate that vocabulary and how well it did, and then we could can move on to another one. I just wanted to say that because uh, that because it sounds like everything's moving, but in, there are some things that aren't moving, and that's that is the the uh, 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 development and work for the pilot. That that is something that is uh, is a process, and it uh, it is uh, dependent on its first step to to be able to get on to the next step and the next step and the next step. So that was just something I wanted to add. Okay, thank you, Sally. Um, that really brings us to the end of our presentation. So I want to just first check with my colleagues to make sure everyone is wants to add something, make corrections to what I said. I usually have to be corrected. Um, 
no, it doesn't look like it. So um, maybe now I'll turn it back over to Aaron, and if you want to um, field us some questions, we can do our best to answer them. Thank you, Paul and everyone else. This is a really great and informative session. Um, so now we'll go through some of the questions that have been asked so far in the question box. And a reminder that if you haven't yet done so, now is the time to please enter your questions. And we'll start with, uh, what are your expectations around retrospectively converting MARC records to bid frame format? I didn't hear the whole question, but I think there had been one that was typed on the screen and I, that I saw earlier. And, and uh, uh, retrospectively converting the records, that is a very difficult task because of the, um, uh, the model that we're using, the, the difference in the model that we're using from the unit record to the, the split up record or split up description which has many uh, positive things for the future, but it make, it's difficult to do from data when you are just having a machine do it. However, we're doing, we're, we're doing our best to, to do that, and that is part of, of the reason we're converting our back file. Uh, one part is that we want our catalogers who are cataloging in BibFrame to have the environment they're used to, they're, that they're used to being able to see their whole back file and then catalog against it. In that back file, they may find a work is already there, and so they only add an instance. We want to simulate that environment at, at, <coughs> in the pilots, but also we want to see how well they convert. And uh, we we will we test we convert and we test and we convert and test and review and uh, uh, we shall see uh, how well we can do. I know we can do you know relatively well. Is it going to be fifty percent, eighty percent? I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is: Are ILS vendors preparing for bib frame, and how much of the uh, responsibility will be on? the library and how much will be on the ILS vendor to prepare? How are ILS vendors preparing for bid frame? I think that's a question. Kurt, do you want to do that? Oh. Might be a quick question. Okay, I'll I'll try to summarize this. I've been doing the looking at the chat and the questions, so I'll go roll over there and answer these. Okay, so we have three questions. Are ILS vendors preparing for BibFrame? Well, yes, we think so, but at the same time, they are pretty heavily dependent on Mark. So they, we've had conversations with Ex Libris. Um, the third question is about what providers. Uh, as well as, you know, there's many other vendors for working with bibliographic records. Uh, Castellini is one that we've also worked with to uh, work with BibFrame. Circe Dynex has also expressed some interest. Um, but uh, there's another question there in the middle. It says, when is BibFrame expected to be implemented in public libraries? Well, I'd say the, the real question is, when is a ILS going to have a BibFrame option as part of their package that they sell and you know honestly I don't I don't really know that might be just a question you might want to both Ex Libris and Circe Dynex I know are really interested in working on linked open data Ex Libris is including linked data within their uh, Alma product so uh, it's definitely something that's going to be in the near future but we don't know exactly so those are those three let's see uh, oh. Do this change the view there? I'm sure, they answered once. That's okay. Um, I can keep going through them if that. Yeah. Helps. What was the next? Yeah. There's another one that was like related to that one. Scroll down to the. Um, yeah. There's one of will ILS providers and vendors transfer the marked data into BibFrame? Um, and then, are there any developments regarding development of tools to open and view BibFrame records? For example, an ILS specifically for BibFrame. Yeah. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. Repeat. Repeat those two questions. Okay. Um, one was: Will ILS providers or vendors transfer the mark data into BibFrame? And then, um, I have to have to find the other one. Are there any developments regarding development of tools to open or view BibFrame records, such as an ILS for BibFrame?
Well, I think um, I'm, I'm sorry. I keep going from speaker to handheld, speaker to handheld. Um, this is definitely a, a question for for technology, right? But but I want to give you my perspective as uh, someone who learned this, uh, and it was quite a surprise that really Bibframe is not an ILS, right? Bibframe is, as I understand it, a set of tools that will be used by your ILS vendor to convert your data. And I think there's some good examples of that already out there, but I was under the false impression that that Bib, at one time, and I've been, uh, you know, I'm corrected now, stand corrected, but that BibFrame was actually um, similar to an ILS. So it is the tools are certainly available now. The Library of Congress has BibFrame tools. There, there will be more, I suspect, in the future that will be made available. Not only the Library of Congress, but I think other um, interested providers have have tools that are available that can be experimented with as well. So anyone else want to add? Sally maybe has a, a comment? Well, you know, one thing is that we have a huge interconnected environment and it, you one person can't do much of anything without it, it uh, breaking something else they already do that saves them money. Uh, one library has this service from that person, that service from another. The, whether it's acquisition or their records or their ILS, uh, their record vendor or even their OCLC where they may be getting their records. And, and so it, I think there will be a whole lot more little um, uh, projects here and projects there and experiments before you'll start seeing an <coughs> a parallel environment that enables you to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to take, an, I'm going to have an ILS that uh, uh, will uh, take in and, and, and use BibFrame records or BibFrame descriptions. And um, I can do that now because I can get that from uh, OCLC. I can get it from various other places. And I can also run my acquisitions off of that and so on. Th these things, it's going to be a while before we have the ability to for a, a, a library to say I'm going to switch to this environment for my record descriptions. I think. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hi, uh, boy, I'm really overwhelmed by a list of questions that I see on the board. So, I'm, but I'm going to let you tell us which ones you want okay. to address. Um, we'll get through, and just to let the attendees know, we're going to get through as many questions as we can, and then our presenters have graciously offered to answer the remaining of them, and we'll post those on the Elect website along with the slides and the recording, the link which will be shared as soon as we're done answering the questions. Um, so our next question is, are there plans to include a work database in LC linked data services? Hi, this is Kirk again. I'm going to try to hit a few of these. Um, so yes, we we actually did in our um, our more our we had a staging or uh, database that we used within the pilot, but wasn't available externally. We did have work records available there, so we do definitely have a plan to have work records available within the uh, ID system. Um, Adam asks, could you speak to the relationship LC has with utilities such as OCLC and Sky River and how LC created records may be shared with other libraries? Well, this is a, this is a great question. Uh, I mean, in terms of our linked data service, that's how we're going to share our information. So it, it's going to be kind of a different system, I guess, than trying to work with them. At the same time, um, OCLC has their own linked data service and their linked data is different, sort of. So um, possibly Sally wants to chime in on this, but I mean, it's going to be a change and I don't know if we really, we have a, definitely have a relationship with OCLC that we've been working with them. Um, I don't think we're really kind of, we're, the LD4P project has kind of tried to get to some of these like production level things, so maybe this is something that's going to come up as part of that. I don't know. Do you have a comment? Okay, hold on. I was just looking at there was a question there about creating name uh, name records, uh, personal name, corporate name in BibFrame, and you know, we ha we actually in our linked data service we already have uh, uh, 
what we used to call authorities, but we're not supposed to call them that anymore. <clears throat> but we have uh, descriptions of persons and corporations in RDF, and we use MAS RDF for that. So uh, it, BibFrame is, I don't know, BibFrame is various things. BibFrame is what we call our vocabulary, BibFrame is what we call our pilot, and BibFrame is what we call all of this initiative, but under it, is also a vocabulary that's called MADS-RDF. And uh, so we are already, we, we are taking our MARC records and making um, RDF uh, f available for names and corporate names and personal names and family names. Yeah, this is Paul. I could follow up on Adam's question a bit. When we did the first phase of the pilot, we um, had our catalogers continue to do their authority, what we call authority work, and I guess as long as I'm around, we'll, that's what I'll call it, um, authority work in um, MARC, and um, our refreshing of ID.lc.gov for name authorities is overnight, so they would create, if they needed to create or do any update work in um, in our Voyager ILS, the catalogers would do that, and then the next day those changes would be available in id.lsc.gov. But, you know, one of my wishes, we didn't talk about our wish lists, but I would love to see, maybe not if, if not in phase two, but in a future phase, the reverse scenario when we could actually do our authority work for the NACO program, name authority work, directly in um, maybe perhaps something that feeds right into id.lc.gov or, or in, in another, uh, using another tool that would load directly to id.lc.gov without the, um, the distribution issues that anyone who works with the NACO program is very familiar with, with our NACO nodes having contributions coming from all over into one central database and then distributed back out. To the to the node holder, so so certainly an efficiency might be realized if we do our authority work in um, a big frame environment over um, the traditional mark mark environment. Okay, thank you. Um, and in all those answers, we just covered uh, the coordination with OCLC. But there was a question on: Is there any coordination planned with OCLC and or schema.org? Is there any coordination with schema.org? Yeah, let me um, let me check with my colleagues. This is Kirk again. Okay, so the schema, the OCLC, um, we're, we're kind of partnered loosely with OCLC. Um, in terms of schema.org, a better way to think about both of these is that OCLC is using some of their local metadata, but mostly they're using um, Dublin Core for their fields. And obviously schema.org has their own fields. Um, it's, it's certainly possible to have all of those within a, a particular bibliographic record, and we haven't really looked into like either having relationships or same as relationships or those kind of things, um, and it hasn't really exactly been worked out, but this is probably something definitely we need to work on, especially with our ongoing relationship with OCLC to kind of see where we can work together on those things. So um, it's a good question, and we're definitely going to have to work on that. Okay, what question okay. do you want to do next? Um, let's have, there's a couple about uh, pilot phase one. Um, and there was one that says that it sounds like you were not able to go back and correct mistakes in the bid frame pilot phase one. Was that, is that accurate? We, did, we didn't. Um, yeah, so people, this is, just, this is just what happened in that the technology stack that we had available at the time, it's not gonna, that's not going to be like that in the future. So we're, it's going to have a full editing workflow as part of the next pilot, which would include okay. being able to go back and change things and save and stuff like that. Um, okay, great. Um, and then we have when pilot phase one records were created by LC staff, did they see the results in an end user display? Or what does the end user So see? you, um, we, we never really worked out that particular part of it. Um, uh, there's a couple of things here about ILSs as well, and so I always I always hesitate to compare the two. I feel like as we move move forward, we're moving into new technologies, and I do like the the term discovery system. So 
what I kind of translate those to be is that or is there going to be a discovery system that uses BigPram in the back end? Um, but essentially, it's probably going to look a lot like what we have now, perhaps with some additional features because we do have links and other kinds and works as well. Um, so they got a very basic display, which was in some ways was a lot like, you know, to me it was a lot like a Mark interface because you could see the the raw uh, RDF. So it, that's kind of like a metadata person's display, but it wasn't really like we didn't have a discovery system set up as part of this. Um, so that, that's um, something we're going to kind of work on as part of our, we'll use our link data service to display that. And if you go into ID and you actually look up things like a name, for instance, there's a display there. So it'll probably be in kind of a similar format as that with a little bit updated um, style sheet and some other things. So. Okay. Um, and then and in some ways that kind vein. of replaces the ILS. I mean, it's not an ILS though. It's, it's different. It's hard to compare the two because I feel like it's just kind of, we're, we've moved on to a little bit different technology and so it's, it's it's hard. I don't want to promise we're doing an ILS, but it should be similar. Okay. Um, in that same vein, we have the question: Is there a place where we can go to view a bid frame record alongside a mark record? If you go to bibframe.org/tools, there's a comparison service. Um, that's probably the easiest way you can see a bid frame. Right now, it's set up to do bid frame one. Um, which is you know it's similar enough, and then you can actually compare the two. So you enter in a an LCCN, I believe, that one's my memory serves. You, an LCCN, and then you can compare the two. Okay. Um, can you explain, we had a couple questions about LODs, and one had asked earlier if you could just remind us what that stands for, and then we... Oh, yeah, I answered that. I thought it was easy. It was linked okay. to open data, so, you know, um, all these, these, all these acronyms for different things basically revolve around the idea that we're, you know, we have this data, and it's linked with a, a URI, and then that URI itself has the data behind it, and that's something that we're sharing through the web. So it's not private, it's not in an in a encoding format like MARC, which is very, very complicated, and there's no uh, easy way for computers to process it. We have a part of the idea with L linked open data and RDF is that computers can kind of look at something like this data and actually can kind of somewhat understand it and process it. Okay. Um, and then can you explain how you envision the sharing of bibliograph data in an LOD environment where the notion of a record might no longer be relevant? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, I, that's back to my, Judith wants me to use the handset here. Sorry about that. Okay. So generally what I think is that there's, two things. One is that, again, with linked open data, it's already sharing. So in some ways, it's a it's a sea change. It's different. We're sharing it that way. On the other hand, we have all these different systems and processes in place that are for MARC, and some of these are going to continue. Um, and so maybe, I'm, I again hope that with LD4P, some of these projects kind of think about this. They'll say, you know, this is the kind of thing that needs to be done, and it'll, be, it'll work not necessarily in a complete 100% open linked open data way, but it'll it'll be something that works together. Um, I mean, like groups like the like PCC, I don't think are going to go away. Uh, you know, OCLC isn't going to go away, so there has to be some of those processes in place, and we'll have to work on that. So, uh, but I don't think we've really it's it's our it's a it's a great question, and we we definitely need to work on that some more. Um, we have time for a couple more, I think. Uh, first, is Google looking at the BibFrame pilot format? <laughs> is Google looking at the BibFrame pilot format? I don't think so, no. But, you know, they, they um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll give them a call and see what they say. I don't know. We haven't really <laughs> <laughs> bugged them about it. But at the same time, they're, you know, they're going to be, they're aggregating lots and lots of data. So if they're seeing lots and lots of RDF that's in BibFrame, you know, they're going to want to know more about it. So. It, it may be just a fact, a fact that we just don't have a lot of it out there that's available to be crawled by Google. Okay. Um, and finally, a bid frame camp for catalogers interested in learning to use the tools to further training and documentation um, would be really helpful. Is there any such thing yeah, out well, there? Uh, we don't have anything planned today, but um, Sally, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. I mean, we go to, we've gone 
to ALA midwinter and annual, and we do various presentations about MIF frames. So um, there's and there's some definitely interest to kind of extend this pilot from you know our institution to kind of share it through throughout. So we'll we'll think of something about that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. That's all the time we have for now. Oh, um, Seth, Judith wants to answer bib frame cat, camp for catalogers. She's interested. Oh, okay, go ahead. Being the being the counselor for that, I guess. Um, this is um, this is Judith Cannon speaking. Uh, right now, we're not exploding this because we it's it's still in its infancy, and um, we may do more after phase uh, two test. But um, we did do an open session for OPCO. And we have, as I said earlier, made all the training materials that we used available on the Catalogers Learning Workshop page, um, or website, I should say. And we will do the same for all the training materials we create for phase two. Um, whether following phase two, we will do um, any sort of training um, and offer it to the library community, I don't know. I do know the training materials will be there. And I know that we, when we did this two, um, we did an afternoon training session with people that came to the PCC Operations Committee meeting. They're the people that do the actual cataloging. It was very well received, but what they asked us is that they would, um, if we would hold sessions next year where they could come with any questions and answers they wanted. Because what happened is some of them went and got some more detailed training on Friday afternoon after OPCO and the rest came into a room where um, a selection of network development and Mark Standards Office staff were present and they answered their really complex questions, like some of the questions you've got up here right now. And the people just, they were just loved it. They lapped it up. They were there for three hours, um, all talking about linked data and bib frame. And so they've asked us to hold a session like this again for, um, for the OPCO next year. And we've already sent out messages to them that, that we will be doing this Friday afternoon. So it was such a hit. Maybe this is something that we could possibly hold um, at ALA if we can find um, time available to us uh, to do this. So um, I'm, I am very interested in your desire to do that and I certainly will be exploring it with um, Beecher Wiggins. And um, there's a question up there that I want to answer. Yes, it is true, the catalogue is working in BibFrame in, um, that were the pilot participants in phase one, once they submitted their record, they could not bring it back and correct it. So if they submitted it and they suddenly realized as they were hitting the submit button, they had an error in it, there wasn't anything they could do um, to the bib frame record. So we just told them not to worry about it. It was not the master record. The master record was going into LC's um, ILF Forger. Okay, um, do you want to you want us to take some more questions? I haven't looked at the time. Um, it is that we're actually got about two minutes left, and I do have to give a few closing statements. But I will take note of these questions and send them to you so we can still make the answers available to the attendees. Um, but thank you all very much for your time. Um, so we hope that everyone found today's session informative. Soon after the session, you'll be able to access the slides and recording for today's webinar. Um, which, I'm sorry, I'm sure waiting to kind of have a delay here. I, okay, there we go. Um, so the direct link 
to the page where you'll find the slides recording and answers to the remaining questions is this link that's on your screen right now. Um, it's also the information page for today's webinar. So if you went to register for the webinar, you can go back to the same page to find that information. Um, we have other aspects of BibFrame and linked data that will be covered in more detail in the next five webinars that follow today's session. Registration information for each can be found at the link on the top of the screen. On October 19th, we'll have putting the link in linked data, which will focus on the concept of URI, IRI as the core of the linked data and semantic web operations. This session will cover both the conceptual aspect of URI linking and the workflow and functional implications of moving from traditional authority control to URI-based authority control. On October 26th, the session will be Embedded URI and MARC, an essential for linked data. This presentation will focus on the transition of existing MARC-based catalogs to URI-based MARC as an important step in the migration to BibFrame native records. November 2nd is From Here to BibFrame, focusing on a high-altitude roadmap for complete conversion process, as well as a discussion of various tools and methods that will assist with the transition. On November 9th, we have Modeling and Encoding Serials in BibFrame. The session will be devoted to a discussion of serials cataloging in the BibFrame environment. Serials cataloging has consistently presented the most significant BibFrame conversion obstacle, and this session is specifically designed to address this area of library operations head-on, offering a theoretical overview and practical solution to the problem. And the last webinar in the series on November 16th will be linked to data cataloging workflows, focusing specifically on the impact conversion to BibFrame that will have on library workflows, including a discussion of staffing and training issues and recommendations. In addition to the other webinars in this series, we have many other events coming up. In November and December, we have webinars on collection development and data management. See the ELECT website for more information on these. ELECT also offers web courses which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. The next discussion will begin on October 25th, covering gift management. And finally, thank you to our presenters from the Library of Congress. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Catherine Balek and Mary Reeder, and Megan Doherty from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. This will conclude our session.